praise Lord for his presence this morning time. Hallelujah. Let us uh, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17. I won't go there just yet, uh, but uh, that's where we will go towards the end of my message. Um, today we're going to talk about a book that we always um, talk about, which is the Word of God. How many have the Word of God with you this morning? Can I see it? All right, let me see. I see some dust flying in the air. Good thing we have masks on, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm uh, happy that all of us have brought the Word of God this morning. Um, as we know, and sometimes we, under, uh, we think not as seriously about the miracle, which is the Word of God that is in our hands and in our homes. Without the Word of God, where would we be? Now, a lot of this I'm going to tell is really for our younger brothers and sisters. So those who are older and more knowledgeable might find this as, a, as something you already know or as a refresher. But we know the Word of God, the Bible, contains the Word of God. And the Bible consists of 66 books for more than 40 authors of different backgrounds, written over a span of 1,500 years in three different languages, and there's one story weaving through every story of each book of the Bible, and it is the, the God's redemption story, God's redemption of mankind. And generally, um, we've heard people describe the, Bible, the New Testament and Old Testament this way, that the Old Testament is Jesus concealed, and the New Testament is Jesus revealed. And the Bible helps us interpret the Bible. And I, I, I found this really good chart online that I, I, I don't know how clearly you can, you can see it, uh, but I, 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 what I'm, why am I showing this is so that each of you can see how the Bible quotes itself. So I, let me just take a few moments just to kind of explain. I, mean, I understand nobody will understand what's all there, but uh, let me just kind of highlight some things for you. So when we look at the New Testament... We can see here which books of the Old Testament are most influential to the New Testament writers. Okay, so on the top of that circle, you see the Psalms. And, and the, those bands or the bridges you see, are um, the, it links to the, the book of the Bible that, is, it, it, that cites the other book. So uh, the wider the band is, the more citation there is. Okay, so if you look at the book of Psalms, for example, that band, that pink if it's, I don't know how, what color it shows there, but the pink band that goes down to Hebrews is the widest of them all because Hebrews cites the Psalms through, uh, through, the, uh, through that book. The author of Hebrews cites the Psalms. And, and, and so the Psalms is a very important book. And sometimes we make jokes, and I think there's legitimacy in that. That's a favorite book everybody likes to read because it applies so much to our uh, condition, right? Uh, there's a, the author, uh, the, the psalmist, uh, talks about his his um, his condition in his life, his mental condition, his uh, heart condition, and it, it it really touches us. But also, what's more most important about the Psalms is that it directly aligns with many messianic prophecies, and that's why we see the Psalms quoted often by the New Testament authors. So the other ones that we see the New Testament authors cite is Isaiah, of course, and Exodus and Deuteronomy. So if you kind of go down the circle, you can kind of see that. Um, and, the, and if you've done some study of the Bible, you know that there are certain books of the, in the New Testament that most rely on the Old Testament to prove something, right? And so the, those are Romans, Hebrews, of course. Hebrews is a, it's a sermon, really expository sermon breaking down Old Testament scripture and explaining to us the, uh, the prophecies of Christ. And out of, all, out of all the Gospels, we know the, the Gospel of Matthew, right? It's written to the, the Hebrew community. So Matthew makes it a point to emphasize what Jesus did here fulfills this passage in the Old Testament. So that's why if you go down that circle uh, from uh, counterclockwise, you'll see 
uh, Matthew there before Acts. And, and then when we, when we've gone through the book of Acts, and many times we have pointed out to you in the sermons of each of the apostles uh, or those like evangelists like Stephen, how they often pointed to the Old Testament. And so uh, in here, we also, later on when we read from Acts chapter 17, we're going to see how the, the apostles and the evangelists of the day point to the Old Testament scriptures to, to, uh, to, to um, show Christ to the Jewish people. I hope that was somewhat, somewhat helpful for each of us. So, um, so I was saying that the Bible it helps us interpret the Bible. And so, you know, if you want to know how to interpret the Old Testament, look at the way Jesus and the apostles interpreted the Old Testament. That is the primary way for us to know how do we, how do we uh, analyze the Old Testament scriptures. And so now we were talking about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books, right? And uh, there are all kinds of genres in, in the Old Testament. We cannot interpret the Old Testament the same from beginning to end. There are, there, there's historical books. There are prophecies. There are po there's poetry. And, 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 so, and, the, and then there, there are different other narratives as well. And so we cannot just literally take one verse of, in the Old Testament and, and apply that same standard to all other verses. But, but when we look at it in light of the New Testament, in my view, there are two major, uh, major goals that we, do, we have to have in mind when we look at the Old Testament. One, we need to find Jesus in the Old Testament. Because I told you, right, that Jesus, that in the Old Testament, is Jesus concealed. There are, there are direct prophecies of Christ and there are types and shadows. And, and when we read through the New Testament, we can see whether it's in Hebrews or in other passages of Scripture, uh, we can see where those typologies and the shadows are revealed in light of what Christ has done for us. So if I were to, uh, let me just read some Scripture portions for you. That not, now, we can even look at, like, look at Jesus' words himself to know that the Old Testament is about me. We, we know this, and I'm just going to bring it in your remembrance. John chapter 5, 39 to 40, it might be on the screen. So you search scriptures because you think in that, that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 46 to 47, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Again, these are the words of Jesus talking about the Old Testament. And one more scripture, let me just read for you. I'm not going to talk much about it because of the lack of time, but Luke 24, 44 to 48 should be also on the screen. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with, still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. When we read through the Gospels, we see how with pinpoint accuracy Christ is looking to fulfill every demand, every prophecy uh, of the Old Testament. And that was... His drive was to, to fulfill the, everything that was written about him. And everything was hidden from the minds of the disciples until he resurrected and, and he was with them, right, uh, after his resurrection. And he opened their minds to understand scripture. If you remember the, the, Jesus visiting the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they talked about how sad what, what was happening, that Jesus was killed on a, this a per, a person, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, and then this person, you know, this person who is Jesus walks by them and says, Are you a foolish or a slow minded? Don't you understand that all these things are, are said about him in the scriptures? And he opened their minds also to see and pointing out prophecies in scripture and saying, See, this fulfills what happened just a few days ago. So when we look at the, old, the, the early church preaching and teaching, it's a, it centered around this. It centered around explaining the prophecies and shadows and types of Christ. And 
they were tying, the apostles were tying these things to what, what they w- witnessed in person. And so when we read here in uh, Acts 17, you're going to see that whether there's Paul or others, they're reasoning with the Jews in synagogues. They're reasoning, they're discussing. They're talking about what, what do you think that passage means? And then they may have a different answer. Oh, we're, yes, that's true. We're still waiting for the Messiah. Well, did you know that this happened? You know, this is the way that the early evangelists and apostles were reasoning with the Jews. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, we'll go into that just uh, in a bit. So first goal is to find Jesus in all of the Old Testament. That's a lifelong goal. We hear it often in the pulpit and in Bible studies. But that is the first goal. Second goal is to keenly learn how God dealt with the Israelites. Right? Because everything that happened as a result of the rebellion and seeing God's faithfulness even in that is, is an example for us. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 1 through 11, it's a long passage. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses. Uh, but, you know, Paul says this, that, you know, he, he talks about them being baptized under the, uh, in the cloud and the sea. They ate the same spiritual fruit, the food. They drank the same spiritual drink from the rock of Christ. You know, and then he says in verse 6, now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters like some of them. You must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. We must not put Christ to the test as some did or grumble. And verse 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. These things happen for our instruction. And so a primary goal is for us to, our sin and our, our, our lack of faithfulness all ought to ring true when we read the Old Testament saying, Lord, I have failed you in many ways. And you leads you to repentance. And at the same time, you are Rejoicing because God, through all of it, was still faithful to His people, right? Fulfilling His purpose, showing mercy. You know, they were sent to captivity but brought back. There's this, there's this, there's ebb and flow that we see happening in the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament, 27 books, right, in the New Testament. From 30,000 feet, so to speak, from a big picture point of view... If the Old Testament is Jesus concealed, or if it's, let's just say, that this is the anticipation of Christ, and now all these terms I've used are not from me, it's from scholars and such, so uh, um, don't think it, I, I made it up. So if we look at the New Testament, the four Gospels are the manifestation of this anticipated Christ. Like, this is His promise in flesh and blood, right? We see how Jesus interacts with people. From, we see Jesus' uh, history his, from even before his birth onto his resurrection and ascension. In the book of Acts that we're covering right now, it contains the proclamation of Christ. So it goes from the manifestation of Christ. Christ is ascends to heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He sends his promised Holy Spirit. And through the promised Holy Spirit, the gospel is proclaimed. Christ is proclaimed. We see the apostles reasoning with people and talking about the Christ whom they just was here a few years ago in, in, in their time. And then the 21 epistles, uh, it's, 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 showing the, um, it's showing Christ and the teachings of Christ. It's explaining, the explanation of Christ and His teaching. So, anticipa- uh, so Old Testament is anticipation, uh, Gospels are manifestation, the uh, Book of Acts is proclamation, the epistles are the explanation, and the book of Revelation, it reveals the consummation of all things in Christ Jesus. So that's how we ought to, if you're categorizing the Word of God, in light of, if we have a, a lens of Jesus, right? And you, we might have a natural question as to, you know, when, when the New Testament authors talk about Scripture, it often talks about the Old Testament, and when Jesus talked about Scripture, he was talking about the Old Testament. So how, how does the New Testament, how is the New Testament considered Scripture? And I just want to 
this is more of a teaching. So I just want to just quickly say it and move to what I really want to speak about. So first, how we know New Testament scriptures, when, as I mentioned, the New Testament contains the teachings of Christ, the very words of Christ being broken down and taught to people, right? And John describes Jesus as the Word of God in flesh. Okay? In His words alone, there is authority. His words itself are Scripture. This is what Jesus says in the, in the, in the, in the commission, right? In the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. What is the purpose of Christ's teaching? It is to observe all that He has commanded. It is not to, it's not to just to, to store up a bunch of knowledge so that you can show to other people or to show in front of a stage. It is to obey. And, and, and I, when I say that, I'm also looking at myself. Being keen to observe the teachings of Christ. We spend a, a year or so talking about the Sermon on the Mount. All the things that are, are encapsulated in, in that very short message. The depth of it. Second, and so first, the New Testament is uh, authoritative in its scripture because th this contains the teachings of Christ. Second, we see that Peter calls Paul's teachings scripture. Again, this is just a teaching for our younger audience. Second Peter 3, 15 to 16. Let me just read that real quick. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in, in them of these matters. And these are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Now, it's not just saying that Paul's, only Paul's writings are scriptures, and I'll, I'll try to break it down even further. You know, just to talk about Paul, we know Paul said, that said that this, you know, what I receive from the Lord, I deliver unto you. Paul is the anomaly in the sense of all the writers in the New Testament because he didn't have, he wasn't taught physically, directly with Jesus, you know. But in, in his time that he had uh, being sent, to, uh, sent away for, for, was it 13 years, 14 years, he received direct revelation from Christ. And the revelation that we have and what we read uh, it, when it comes to the communion and other things are direct revelations from Christ to Paul. And, uh, you know, Paul often says, I, I say this from the Lord, this is from the Lord. You know, if you read through Corinthians, for example, you see that. And so the other, other writers and other authors in the New Testament are also considered scripture because they are the disciples of Christ. And, and they are, again, they're dividing and, and they're, they're breaking apart the, the teachings of Christ to that situation happening, in, whether it's a church or whether it's a community of people. You know, we're seeing in the New Testament the explanation in a way that's very contextual to that circumstance, in, 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 whether it's that, that, church, that church is facing false teachers, or if that church is going through a bout of uh, rebellion and sin, we see the New Testament authors addressing those things and pointing back to the teachings of Christ. Peter says, you know, when he talks about Scripture and writings, he says that these are men moved by the Holy Spirit, uh, spoke from God. The, these people were, were moved along by the Spirit of God. And they spoke from God. And Paul says that the church was built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone. I'm giving you more, just more and more proofs to add on to the fact that this New Testament scripture is also authoritative just as the Old Testament. And the author of Hebrews finally, uh, uh, and I'll end with uh, uh, this in terms of uh, the background of the Bible. The author of, author of Hebrews, uh, as we know in the beginning, he says, God spoke long ago through the prophets and these days... He has spoken to us in the Son. So when we look at the New Testament, this is the Son of God speaking to us. So it's just as authoritative and just as serious as, as the Old Testament. 
All right, now going to Acts 17. Uh, I want to pull up a map real quick just to show where we are, and then uh, uh, we'll read Acts 17 real quick. And I'll be very short with my, my part in the Acts. So we are right now, in the, if you look at the screen, the, the left portion, top left, uh, Paul uh, coming down from Philippi, uh, Amphipolis, uh, uh, Apollonia, yeah, I'm sure, I hope you can see that, Thessalonica, Berea. Okay? So we're in the Thessalonica, Berea portion today for today. Uh, Minu last week uh, and so did uh, Joe talked about, I mean, we went to Athens actually, but we're going back. <laughs> uh, we're going back to Berea just for a second. So now turning to Acts chapter 17, 1 through 5, let me just read, I'm gonna, just going to read and then I'll break down what the Lord has placed in my heart to share. Acts 17, 1 through 5, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish temple. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Again, this, talks, this is talking about what we just discussed. And verse 3, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Verse 4, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a, quite a few prominent women. Verse 5, but all, the other je Jews were jealous, so they round up some of the bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Now jumping to verses 10 through 13, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character of, than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what if Paul was saying, said was true. As a result, take note of that, that phrase, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was, all, was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. I want to focus right into the Berean Jews. And those of us who have exposure to this uh, passage already know where I'm going with this. But again, this is to my younger brothers and sisters. The Berean Jews were, were compared, and we always hate being compared. Uh, as a child growing up, I know, being compared to my cousins was the worst thing in the world. I always heard something great about them. So here, Scripture is comparing two, two, the, the Jews in two different places. The Berean Jews compared with the Jews in Thessalonica. The Berean Jews were, verse 11, were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For, why were they? For... They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what Paul said was true. What does a noble character mean? Noble character means having an open and fair mind. And some, some uh, translations call it noble-minded. This thing about being noble character, uh, you know, the, the way that I crystallized it was being humble. Being humble to hear. Not being instantly triggered when something is said and we see those who are triggered by it right some of the jews that were jealous they were triggered by this gospel and they wanted to harm paul and his and his uh, team they received the message with great eagerness again this these are the jewish people in berea how do you receive eagerness i thought about this like how 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 do we cultivate eagerness in our heart some people like to say that it is, it is a, 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 a gift of God, that eagerness. I think there's probably something to that. But I think also, I think it's, it's just an attitude of the heart. Some of us have closed our hearts and our minds to hear the word of God. When we see somebody stand up to preach, we're thinking about that person and their past or their 
uh, their disqualifications and we fail to hear the word that is being preached. Or maybe you, you come across a lot of things that, that bring skepticism about the word of God and that colors your mind when you try to read scriptures and your mind is closed, you're cynical. So the Berean Jews here came with an open mind and that is what all God is asking us to do is come before him with an open mind and, and be keen to listen. Be keen to listen and read his word. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a seminary degree. All you need to come with is a humble heart to have an eagerness to hear and listen and read his word and let him handle the rest. They examined the scriptures every day. Now we know this. Scriptures and the scrolls were only in the synagogue. So they had to travel to their synagogues, make that effort to open up these scriptures and read them together. I don't think anybody had their own quiet time, right, with the scrolls. You guys go away, let me have my quiet time. No, this was a group effort. Everybody looking in together, reading and discussing. This is a community effort. They're coming every day. There's consistency. All these are principles for us also to think about. And in verse 12, as a result, this is a direct result of their noble character, their eagerness. They're willing to exam together daily the effort they took. It says that many of them believed. And what is the contrast with Thessalonica? There some people were persuaded as well. They joined with Paul and Silas, but... There was also other Jews who were jealous. Now there's like a saying that says, you know, the same sun that melts the ice also hardens the clay. The word of God can be preached to a person, two people, and they can react in totally different ways. And one person will repent and accept Christ as their Savior. The other person will be cynical and angry and, and, and jealous and, and fight back. And this is the reality here. The, the jealous Jews... They traveled, I think it's 45 miles apart or something like, maybe it's more than that, between Thessalonica and Berea. They took the effort, instead of, Bereans took the effort to go to the synagogue to examine scriptures. Thessalonians took the effort to travel all the way to Berea just to attack Paul and Silas. You can see the difference, the difference here. Let me invite the worship team to come forward. I want to read one more portion. Acts 16, 14. I'm going back a little bit more. and Now we're in Philippi. There, it talks about a woman. A woman named Lydia was listening. She was a seller of purple flat fabrics from the city of Thyatira and a worshiper of God. That term worshiper of God just means she was a God-fearing Greek. That she was open and she was practicing a practicing Jew. And it says here, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So that word starts with what? A woman named Lydia was listening. When Paul was explaining Christ, when Paul was opening scripture, there's a woman named Lydia. A businesswoman, a rich businesswoman. Can you believe that? It doesn't fit any box. We think that it's a certain, it has to be a certain type of a certain way that person can receive the gospel. No, this is a business, rich businesswoman named Lydia. But she was a worshiper of God. She knew the true God in what was revealed, what was concealed. And with that listening heart, with that worshipful heart, the Lord opened our heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And that is what God expects of each of us. You may not have the ability to do what God is calling to do. You may not have the revelation, so to speak. But what God is looking for is a person who would listen to his words. The person who would worship Him and give their life to Him. And the Lord will do the rest. He will do the work of opening your heart and giving you revelation, giving you a commission. And there might be some of you here, you're so distracted by what is happening in your life, that when the Word of God is being preached, you're thinking about your life circumstance. And maybe you might say, you know, if you're an advanced Christian, right? You might say, Lord, if you really want me to hear it, make me hear it. That's not, that's not the attitude that God is looking for. What God is looking for is, Lord, despite my circumstance, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen for your word. I'm going to be keenly listening to what you have to say to me, Lord. And in that humble 
surrendered attitude, the Lord will speak and do a miraculous work in your heart. Lord, we come before you, O oh God. With the heart of surrender, O oh God, we want to hear your voice. We heard this morning the voice of God. We want to hear the voice of God loud and clear, Lord. Forgive us, O oh God, from everything that holds us back. Our cynicism, our jealousy, our pride, our sin. Oh, we lay it all out, all those ugliness out, O oh God. And we are here to humble before you, God, and to keenly listen and hear your word. Lord, we have so many Bibles at our home, Lord God. Forgive us for not opening the scripture. We just have to walk two steps and there's a Bible. Sometimes we trip over the Bibles because there's so many in our house. Sometimes we use it as paperweight. Sometimes we use it as a, a way to put our phone on top of it so we can get better height to watch something. Lord, we, we're, we're so fallen, oh God, in many ways. And we pray, Lord, our callous attitude to the Word of God will be changed right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We will be the students of the Word that we will see the Old Testament and the New Testament, the concealed Christ and the revealed Christ, to see Christ high and exalted and also take to walk in the wisdom laid out in the Old Testament to, to learn from the mistakes of others. And Jesus, I pray this moment that some hearts will be open to hear the Word of God being preached. And we pray for the man of God who will be preaching from your Word. And I pray, Lord, a special anointing upon him, O oh Lord God. Speak through him, O oh God, today. And I pray that the Word today will be for many sitting here with the listening heart, O oh Father. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor, O oh God, for all you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.